drug that's the object of this discussion and it's something I've developed over the last few years. We sold it two years as a dietary antioxidant and it worked fantastic. It's a very potent antioxidant. Uh, and I knew at that time that it bound in chelated mercury. But I didn't make any claims because with the FDA is what you claim that makes something a drug, not what it does. And uh, <clears throat> I, wanted to, I wanted people that were mercury toxic to get well. And uh, any antioxidant worth its uh, salt actually causes you to lose toxic heavy metals if they're working properly. So what we're going to talk about today is we're going to concentrate on this because I think it's going to be, we've made it through phase one. In other words, we're out of what is called the valley of death for drug development. The compound shows no toxicity at all in human phase one trials, shows excellent pharmacokinetics about somewhere between 40 and 70 percent is absorbed by the human body versus 15 to 18 percent in rats. So it's very well taken up, and it caused absolutely not a single adverse effect in the phase one study. And most importantly, this is a, a, a compound that binds uh, free heavy metals, specifically highest affinity is for mercury. And it does this, but yet when you take it into the animal body in both the dog study, a rat study, and now a human study, the compound did not, did not deplete essential heavy metals. And I'm going to explain to you why that happens, because that was my biggest fear. I thought it would deplete the body of copper and iron. And it doesn't. And it's based on the, the biochemistry and the, the chemistry, the hydrophobicity of the compound, that it doesn't get near the iron and the copper because they're chelated by proteins and uh, are kept in the water phase, where they're transported through the blood to the, the sites of use. And it just doesn't. I mean, the testing has shown that very clearly by three different groups now. So this is the compound we're talking about. <clears throat> and what I wanted to talk about uh, first is that it's made out of two natural compounds, dicarboxybenzoate. Benzoates are used as food preservatives, and they're found in uh, cranberries and apples. It's a natural product. And we couple that through uh, the two carboxylate groups by an, a med linkage, which is a natural occurring linkage that you have in the protein structure, to cysteine, which is cysteine without the carboxylic acid group on it. And this makes a compound that has uh, no charge, very hydrophobic, and we found out it's extremely stable as a dry powder. It has a shelf life of over five years. We have yet to see any of it break down if you keep it dry and at room temperature even. So it's very, it's very stable and uh, it works uh, quite well. <clears throat> this compound binds mercury exceptionally tightly and we'll show that structure on the next one. Uh, and we have uh, made that without any problem. And I want to make sure I'm not... There are two sulfur groups on this and the essential thing about this, you know, when you're treating heavy metal toxicity, Metals have what they call coordination chemistry. In other words, they have to have the two compounds or the two uh, connecting atoms have to be at different angles. With mercury, it has to be 180 degrees. And so with this compound, it has these arms that can move around, latch onto a mercury, bring it over, and latch on the other side. And when it does that, it'll never let it go. I mean, you have to destroy the structure of the compound at plus 237 degrees centigrade to make it release the mercury and it keeps it in your body in, in that condition. So we've, and we've done some other modifications. It binds iron the same way, except iron doesn't have the same coordination chemistry or angles as does mercury. And copper doesn't have the same as iron. So you need something that can move around and form different geometries with regard to binding the heavy metals. This compound will bind every heavy metal that has an attraction to sulfur, which is almost all of them, uh, and it binds them very, very tightly and very quickly. And it renders them non-toxic. Uh, non now, <clears throat> the other things about this uh, molecule, for example, this is how it binds mercury in 180 degree binding, and it binds mercury tighter than any of the other molecules. And it binds it so tight that we have made this complex. You can dissolve this compound in ethanol and add it to a water mixture of containing mercury chloride it's spinning very rapidly, and you'll form the mercury NBMI complex. Pardon me. 
it formed this complex and it precipitates out. When we make this complex, we know of nothing that will dissolve it. We can put it in all the rigorous, I mean, high acid, high base, nothing will cause this to dissolve. Um, so how does it get out of the body? I want, I, we've got the data to show that there's a P450 modification site here where this gets hydroxylated, and more than likely on, after that hydroxylation on the first step of the P450 uh, system, you add glutathione to it. Glutathione is charged, and it makes the entire molecule charged, and it gets excreted through the feces. And we, we've shown that it does go out through the feces. So this is a, a, a very uh, uh, good compound, and it's totally inert. In other words, once, once the mercury is bound, it's no longer toxic. It can't react with anything. And uh, as I said, it's not soluble in anything tested to date. We made this compound uh, with the mercury complex, and we gave it orally to rats, uh, 2,000 milligrams per kilogram body weight. If that were free mercury or if any small percentage of that mercury were released in the rat's gut or intestinal area, he would have had, he would have gotten sick, it should have killed him. And we did that, none of them died, none of them even acted sick. We took the, uh, we did a, uh, an autopsy on the rats, looked at their kidneys, there was no inflammation to the kidney. So this compound here is totally without toxicity when given orally to uh, rats. So let's talk about its binding capacity, because I get uh, a lot of questions about this, and I've always gone too fast uh, probably talking about it. But if we looked at NBMI removal, which is what this compound was made for, by the way, uh, to remove metal from aqueous solutions. So if we take mercury, lead, cadmium, uh, copper, and iron, and we put them in there at different pHs, four, six, four or six, as those were about the, the pHs that you might run into in a, a biological system, and you have the initial concentration is 50 parts per million. The final concentration, you can see they're all above, above 0.1 part per million. Uh, and it removes 99.7%, binds mercury the tightest, and all of them it binds incredibly tight if there's no competition around. And when you put the, uh, when you make this solution, these things precipitate out. And what we've done a series of studies. So we make the mercury NBMI complex. It precipitates out. So we take off the top solution. And then we add to that huge amount, high levels of iron, copper, zinc. And they will not displace the mercury. Because you can measure the mercury, you know, in the, in the water layer. If you put in, uh, say, make an iron NBMI complex, precipitate it out, and add mercury, the mercury will slowly displace the iron and uh, you'll end up with the mercury in the bottom at that. So with that type of thing, we have, got a, we have developed a list of which one it binds the tightest, which ones it binds second tightest, et cetera. And it's just about like you see here on this, uh, this slide. It's mercury tightest, then lead, then cadmium, then copper, then iron. So this compound uh, does this very quickly, and it causes them to become inert and to precipitate. And the leaching effect, and people says, because you see one of the major problems with DMPS and DMSA, it can bind mercury in your soft tissues, and as it gets excreted into the bloodstream and goes out the kidney, it uh, releases the mercury and uh, builds up mercury in the uh, kidney and causes renal failure. This compound, once it binds these metals, never lets it go. And if we look at the leaching uh, experiment and how much of this is leached over a period of time, so we make the complex uh, of mercury, uh, and we have it at pH 4, 6, and 10. 4, 6, and 10 for two days, 30 days, and 60 days. And we look at the amount that comes out in the solution. There is, it's less than 0.05 or 0.5%. In other words, it, and it doesn't change from uh, two days to 30 days to 60 days. It stays the same. There is no, uh, or essentially, the minimum level of mercury is leached uh, right from the start. So it does not, once it binds mercury, release it. You don't have to worry about the translocation from uh, your liver to your kidney. This compound, once it binds, it stays, it stays bound forever. And so uh, why we change it? When I made this, I made this as a mercury chelator. 
and I and I'll have to admit I made it, hopefully hoping I could help uh, certain illnesses that I thought were caused by mercury, and you all know what those are. Uh, I don't need to re repeat them here. <clears throat> but what I noticed in the process is that this compound looked like an antioxidant, and that would allow me to say this is dietary and it's an antioxidant, and we could deliver it cheaply and quickly uh, to people that really needed it. And we did that, and this is the comparative OREC score of uh, NBMI. You can see it's very high. This is not the, uh, this is uh, close to 200 to 300,000. And this is a uh, acai berry, and this is uh, dark chocolate, etc. The other uh, compounds, there's nothing that even approaches this that's safe and easy to take that will uh, fight off or scavenge oxygen radical. ORAC means oxygen radical absorbance capacity. How much of the free ox uh, oxygen radicals can you absorb? Uh, and this is a test, a measure of the compound's ability to prevent oxidation of trilox, uh, which is a, a vitamin E analog by re reactive oxygen species. This is what they're generating, and your compound is supposed to compete with trilox, uh, trilox, pardon me, uh, uh, to, to prevent it from being oxidized, and that's vitamin E. So what this tells you is that this compound would maintain or help you maintain your vitamin E levels. And it's well known that if you are under a lot of oxidative stress, if you're under oxidative stress, your vitamin E levels go down. And I would submit to you that just about every one of the fatty, uh, fat soluble vitamins would drop dramatically on exposure to oxidative stress. That's the reason why people, they keep telling you, telling you you're low on vitamin E and D, et cetera. And uh, so this means that NBMI or OSR would preserve the vitamin E in cells. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, the hydroxy radical absorbance capacity test, the score for OSR was 300 per kilogram. And that's the one that really causes the most damage in the body. And this is a measure of a compound's ability to prevent oxidation of trilox by hydroxy-free radicals. Therefore, OSR is one of the most potent antioxidants ever tested, ranking with clove oil and other essential oils. However, OSR is without toxicity and without burning your mouth when you take it. It's very easy. I mean, I take it, and uh, you're looking at someone who's taken it, uh, it'll be eight years this November, and I've taken it about every day and sometimes two or three times a day. And... Uh, it doesn't generate any uh, negative effect. It doesn't build up in your body. It doesn't cause your eyes to go uh, uh, fill up with uh, OSR or anything like that. It's totally safe. Totally safe. It's as safe as anything you could take. The pharmacokinetic studies show that the uh, OSR NBMI peaks in the plasma and all organs tested, including the brain, two hours after ingestion. So when you take this, it peaks up, and in humans, it was at about two and a half hours to three hours. So that was very similar, except in a rat, they excrete this very rapidly. It's mostly gone in a, a short period of time. Uh, I think it's 85 percent, uh, down to about 85 uh, percent uh, is gone within 24 hours. In humans, it has a half-life of 22 hours. So that means if you take it twice a day, you're going to keep a fairly level amount of NBMI in your in your body, in your blood, which uh, is important for uh, designing the treatments that you would give a patient. Uh, the plasma half-life in rats is six to seven hours, but in humans it's 22 hours. The hydrophobic nature of OSR or NBMI allows it to penetrate all the membranes and the blood-brain barrier. It goes into the bone, it goes into the uh, uh, brain, and there, OSR can scavenge reactive oxygen species. It can chelate the metals and help salvage glutathione and protect against free radical type damage. And we, we seem to see that. I, 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 I'm not allowed, if you understand, to give you a name of a disease and tell you what result we've got at this time. But I can tell you it does a lot more than just decrease tremors and uh, mercury uh, related illnesses or illnesses that we would relate to mercury if you're if you're believing everything said by general medicine it's a very unusual a very potent compound <clears throat> now 